Good morning and welcome to our service of worship here at Golden Isles Presbyterian Church. If you are uh, joining us for the first time this morning, we're very glad that you have uh, joined us here on our uh, virtual service and we hope one day to meet you in person when we uh, gather together again uh, in corporate worship on the Lord's uh, Day. Uh, before we begin our service this morning, uh, again, just a couple of announcements to remind you of uh, some of the other uh, activities that we've got going on to help uh, you during this time of um, uh, quarantine, isolation, lockdown, uh, whatever uh, your preferred term is. We have on uh, Thursday evenings a Zoom prayer meeting. If you would like to be part of that, uh, please just email me at the church and I'd be happy to get your name on the invitation we send out an invitation on thursdays uh with the meeting information including a password we're trying to keep it as secure as possible so if you'd like to be part of that let me know and I'd be happy to give you uh, access to it uh, we also have uh in lieu of our small groups and our equipped seminars uh, we're doing a ligonier connect uh, group which is uh, currently on the Attributes of God, uh, a course that is taught by Dr. Steve Lawson. Uh, it's a wonderful course. Uh, it's long, it's I think 16 sessions, but uh, I've opened it up so you can do it as quickly or as slowly as you would like to do. Uh, the benefit of the Ligonier Connect group is there's discussion questions, there's uh, a study guide that goes along with it to help you engage thoughtfully with the 25 to 30 minute uh, lectures. Uh, I would highly encourage you to uh, be part of this group. You will come away from this study with a grander view of God than when you went into it. Uh, if you would like to be part of that, again, just email me uh, and I'd be happy to send you an invite and to bring you into that group. We are only a week or two into it, so you're not behind. And like I say, um, it's, it's open. I haven't set a track for, for going through it. So you'd be able to, to jump right in and catch right up. Uh, so please let me encourage you to take, uh, to take part in, in both of these things that we are offering uh, apart from this virtual uh, service. But it is good for us to be uh, here this morning. It is good for us on the Lord's Day morning to gather together in worship, to set the eyes of our hearts on the glory of Almighty God, to come during this time of great disruption, to still our hearts before God, and to be still on this Lord's Day and know that He is God. We are called to worship this morning by the words of Psalm 124, verse 8, and 145 verses 18 and 19. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desire of those who fear him. He also hears their cry and saves them. Let us pray. Almighty and ever blessed God, as we are gathered together on this Lord's Day morning, gathered though yet separated by the restrictions uh, that we are currently facing, we thank you that we are knit together by the one Holy Spirit who dwells in us. Our Father, we pray that though we continue on during these strange and unusual times, that you would come on these Lord's Day mornings, that you would come now, and that you would bless your people in a special way. Our Father, we pray that you would still our hearts as we come before you now. We pray that you would still our minds from the distractions that run through it. We pray that you would free us, Lord, from the distractions that come from worshipping in our living rooms, the distractions that come from our phones or our computers or our televisions or all the other things that surround us that are not around us when we are together in the sanctuary. Father, we pray that you would help us by your Spirit now, even in these unusual circumstances, to worship in spirit and in truth 
that we would behold your glory, that we would delight ourselves in the magnificence of our God, that we would find rest under the, the shadow of your wings, and that we would be still, remembering all that you are and all that you have done for us in Christ. O oh Lord, come now, we pray, and draw close to us, for we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Our confession of faith this morning is from the Apostles' Creed. Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us now join together in our corporate prayer of confession of sin. Let us pray. Almighty God, our Saviour, help us. We are pained by our graceless hearts, our prayerless days, our poverty of love, our sloth in the heavenly race, our sullied consciences, our wasted hours and unspent opportunities. We are blind while the light shines around us. Take the scales from our eyes, grind to dust our hearts of unbelief. O oh Lord, in your grace, make it our highest joy to study you, meditate on you, gaze on you, that we might sit like Mary at your feet, lean like John on your breast, appeal like Peter to your love, count like Paul whatever gain we had as loss for the sake of Christ. O Lord, we believe. Help our unbelief. Amen. Hear now the assurance of God's pardon for those who repent of their sins and look to the Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of those sins. In Romans chapter 8, we read these words. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the love of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. Amen and Amen. Our scripture reading this morning is found in Genesis chapter 22, where we continue to follow on the captivating story uh, of Abraham, uh, a story that is filled with uh, intrigue, uh, a story that is filled with, uh, with ups and downs, times of joy and times of near despair, as we see uh, Abraham uh, both exercising great faith in the promises of God and then in his uh, weakness, uh, committing great sin against his God. Um, but as we continue on in this story, we come this morning to one of the most dramatic parts of the story as Abraham is called to uh, sacrifice his son Isaac. Now, you remember God had promised to Abraham uh, in his covenant with him that he would give him a son, uh, a son who, in whom all the promises of God would come to their fulfillment. 
And after years of waiting, that son was born to Sarah, Abraham's wife, Isaac, that promised child. And now Abraham is told to sacrifice that child to God. It's a moment of great confusion, a moment of great uncertainty in what God is doing here. But we see Abraham trusting in the promises of God, though he does not understand all that is happening and yet faithfully following the word of God. Now, of course, Abraham will call off, uh, God will call off Abraham before he um, uh, executes his son and will uh, provide for him a ram who will be a substitute for his son and who will die in his uh, place. Of course, this story foreshadows God's sacrificing of his own son, Uh, That true and better Isaac, in whom all the promises of God come to their ultimate fulfillment. And in that moment on the cross, we are in the same position of Abraham, not quite understanding how God could execute his son. And yet all the promises come to fulfillment. But of course, in the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, we see it is through his death and resurrection that all these promises have come to their fulfillment. So Genesis chapter 22 this morning, a high point uh, in Scripture, a formative passage in a formative story of Abraham. Let us read from verse 1. After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. He said, Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, And go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. And he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. Then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac his son. And he took in his hand the fire and the knife. So they went, both of them together. And Isaac said to his father Abraham, My father, and he said, Here I am, my son. He said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they went both of them together. When they came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. He said, Do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing that you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day on the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. And the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you. And I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned to his young men. And they arose and went together to Beersheba. And Abraham lived at Beersheba. Now after these things it was told to Abraham... Behold, Melchah also has borne children to your brother Nahor, Uz his firstborn, Buzz his brother, Kemuel the father of Aram, 
Chesed, Hazo, Pildash, Jidlaf, and Bethuel. Bethuel fathered Rebekah. These eight Milcah bore to Nahor Abraham's brother. Moreover, his concubine, whose name was Reuma, bore Teba, Gaham, Tahash, and Makkah. Amen. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our Lord will stand forever. Let us now join together in our pastoral prayer. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-blessed God, you are great and greatly to be praised. There is none like you, the God who sits in the heavens and of whom it is said the earth is his footstool. You are the God who sits outside of space and time and you are the God who rules all things according to the counsel of his own will. Father, it has been said that our hearts are restless and our hearts will be restless until they find their rest in you. For you are the one who made humanity in his own image and likeness, who stamped us unique amongst all of the creatures with the likeness and the image of God that you gave to humanity a law to be kept that we might serve you as your servants on this earth and that we might dwell with you. But Lord, we know that we all like sheep have turned astray. In our father Adam, we broke that first law that you have given and we are guilty in him. But to his sin we have added sin upon sin and we have turned away from the living God and we have indulged our sin. Our Father, we have acted as if we were animals. Just another species within the animal kingdom to follow the desires of their heart. O Lord, we thank you that in your grace you have brought for us in Christ Jesus a Redeemer. That whosoever put their faith in him should have their sins forgiven. And that they should have their humanity restored. And that they should be brought again to have fellowship with God. You are indeed the lifter of our heads. The one who takes away the shame of our sin and the one who restores to us the dignity of our humanity. O Lord, as we come to you this morning, we come in the the midst of a, a world that is in disarray because of sin. O Lord, we confess that there are many times when we grow very at home here, very comfortable on this earth there are times in which we rely upon our own strength and we find our lives going well but father you have brought a season of great disruption to us you have brought in this virus a reminder of just how fragile and frail our humanity is that we are not the immortals that we like to think But we are men and women who are made of dust and ashes, whose lives are but a breath compared to your eternality. Like a vapor we rise and then we disappear. O Father, in this shooting of Ahmed Arbery, you remind us that humanity is not the creatures of inherent good that we like to think that we are. But lie within every one of us, there is that deep corruption in which we have been set not over, not simply over and against God, but over and against one another. In the global economic crisis, you have shown us that our skill and our talent for creating earthly security is not nearly as great as we like to think it is that money 
is not as secure as we like to believe that it is, but in the just uh, the seeming blinking of an eye, you turn this world upside down. Oh, our Father, we pray that you would use all of this as a minister of your own grace, both in the lives of your people, that we might be broken even further from our idols, And that we might be broken even more from our propensity to self-reliance. That we might simply find our rest in Thee. That we might remember that we are not just animals, but we are humans made for fellowship with God. And that we would run to You and find our rest in that fellowship and not in the circumstances of this world. But we pray, Father, also for those who do not yet know you. We think especially of our loved ones. And we pray that you would use this as a minister of grace. It has been said that you whisper to us in our pleasures, but you shout to us in our pains. And there are many who are in pain just now. Many who have lost jobs. Many whose health have been compromised or at the very least threatened. Many who have been shaken to the core by this. And we pray that you would use this to spur them on. That they would seek something greater than themselves. And that they would find in the Lord Jesus the Savior that they need. Oh Father, we pray this morning for the mission of the church. That you would help your people individually and corporately to hold aloft the banner of the gospel in these uncertain times and that we would bid many to come with us and find security in Jesus. We pray as ever for our brothers and sisters who are enduring persecution. Lord, we pray that you would give them grace to bear up under the weight of the oppression they face for the sake of our Lord Jesus. Lord, we pray that you would bless their witness and that you would use them to testify to their persecutors of the grace that is found in Christ that is greater than all of our sins. And that we would see many who now persecute your church come like Paul to be broken before Christ and to give their lives then as living sacrifices, pleasing and acceptable to you. Father, hear us, for we commit this all to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, please turn it with me in your copies of God's Word to Isaiah chapter uh, 7. Isaiah chapter 7. where we'll read from verse 1, and we'll read the whole chapter. In the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, son of Uzziah, king of Judah, Rezin, the king of Syria, and Pekah, the sin of Ramaliah, the king of Israel, come up to Jerusalem to wage war against it, but could not yet mount an attack against it. When the house of David was told Syria is in league with Ephraim, the heart of Ahaz and the heart of his people shook as the trees of the forest shake before the wind. And the Lord said to Isaiah, Go out to meet Ahaz, you and Shear Jashub your son, at the end of the conduit of the upper pool on the highway to the washer's field. And say to him, Be careful, be quiet, Do not fear and do not let your heart be faint because of these two smoldering stumps of firebrands at the fierce anger of Rezin and Syria and the son of Ramalia. Because Syria with Ephraim and the son of Ramalia has devised evil against you, saying, Let us go up against Judah and terrify it and let us conquer it for ourselves and set up the son of Tobiel as king in the midst of it. Thus says the Lord God, it shall not stand, and it shall not come to pass. For the head of Syria is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is Rezin, 
And within 65 years, Ephraim will be shattered from being a people. And the head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is the son of Romalia. If you are not firm in faith, you will not be firm at all. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz, Ask a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be deep as Sheol or high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, and I will not put the Lord to the test. And he said, Hear then, O house of David, is it too little for you to weary men that you weary my God also? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. He shall eat curds and honey when he knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the boy knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land whose two kings you dread will be deserted. The Lord will bring upon you and upon your people and upon your father's house such days as have not come since the day that Ephraim departed from Judah, the king of Assyria. In that day the Lord will whistle for the fly that is at the end of the streams of Egypt and for the bee that is in the land of Assyria and they will all come and settle in the steep ravines and in the clefts of the rocks and on all the thorn bushes and on all the pastures. In that day the Lord will shave with a razor that is higher beyond the river with the king of Assyria, the head and the hair of the feet and it will sweep away the beard also. In that day a man will keep alive a young cow and two sheep. And because of the abundance of milk that they give, he will eat curds. For everyone who is left in the land will eat curds and honey. In that day every place where there used to be a thousand vines worth a thousand shekels of silver will become briars and thorns. With bow and arrows a man will come there. For all the land will be briars and thorns. And as for all the hills that used to be hoed with a hoe, you will not come there for fear of briars and thorns, but they will become a place where cattle are let loose and where sheep tread. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, our Father in heaven, as ever we come to you this morning as a needy people who are in need of the word of God. We pray for the ministry of your Holy Spirit that he would open this word of God to us and apply it to our hearts that we might behold wonderful things within it. Lord, open it to us now and by your Holy Spirit lead us and guide us in our study. For we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this week we come to take up the main part of the book of Isaiah. It's really here that the content of the book begins to develop and unfold. And we are brought in to listen to Isaiah's ministry to those in 8th century BC Judah. In chapters 1 through 5, we were given uh, what we really ought to consider as the prologue to this book. It is the section, those first five chapters, they set the scene for us and very quickly and very dramatically introduce us to the, to the broader scene into which Isaiah is to minister. In broad strokes, the picture has been painted for us that has demonstrated just how bad the situation in Judah has become. And just how far the people of God have deteriorated as they have wandered away from faith in God. You remember in those chapters we are given vivid metaphors that are designed to really capture our heads and our hearts. That we can understand the the rot and the spiritual corruption that has come to be rampant throughout the, this people who were still claiming to be the people of God. But here in chapter 7, we really take up the subject of the book uh, proper. It's here that we get down into the detail of Isaiah's ministry. And from here on, we will be brought to 
to hear and see Isaiah as he interacts personally with the people and the kings of this land. We will be brought in to hear his preaching and we will see the response of the people to the word of God through this prophet. Chapter 6, of course, has prepared us for the reality that their response is not going to be a favorable one. As we saw last week, Isaiah has been warned that what awaits him in Judah is not a receptive audience eager to drink from these streams of living water that Isaiah will present to them, but rather what they will find is a people of hardened hearts, of deaf ears and blind eyes. In 2 Timothy 4.2, Paul encouraged Timothy to preach the gospel in season and out of season. As Paul continued to mentor his protege, he gave him the fair warning that there will be times in which the gospel is to be found both out of season as well as in season. There will be times when the gospel is, is in season, times when many will respond with Uh, with eagerness, times when people will heed the warning of God's judgment, will lay hold of the promises of God's forgiveness in Christ, when they will gladly repent and be saved. What Paul is saying to Timothy is there will be times when, when the word of God preached will bear abundant fruit, times where people will come flooding into the churches, times like we read of in Acts, when thousands are saved on one day. But, Paul says to Timothy, there will be times where the preaching will be out of season. There will be times when people will not want to hear the word of God. There will be times in which the preachers of the gospel are derided and mocked and become pariahs in society. Well, What Paul is saying to Timothy is, regardless, Timothy, you press on and you do the work that God has given you to do and you continue to preach the word of God and you trust God for the outcome. It's the same word that has been given to Isaiah, isn't it? In fact, Isaiah has been told that he really won't enjoy an in-season The furrow that he has been called to plow is a hard one and God has warned them that rather than softening the hearts of the Judeans, the the word that he preaches will serve to harden them further against God and the gospel. As someone once put it, what Isaiah has been confronted with is the preacher's dilemma. If hearers are resistant to the truth, the only recourse is to tell them the truth yet again, but more clearly than before. But to do this is to expose them to the risk of rejecting the truth yet again, and therefore of increasing hardness of heart. And so in many ways we go into chapter 7, knowing how this story is going to end. We come into chapter 7, we come into the body of this book, not expecting to read a story of Jerusalem that is like that of Nineveh. We are not coming into this expecting the king to repent and to lead all of his people in repentance as well. We are not expecting Isaiah's preaching to fall on fertile ground. So we might well ask, well, what should we expect as we go into the body of this book? Well, one of the things that will shine brightly for us is the mercy and the grace of God for a holy, undeserving people. One of the things that we will see, even in this passage before us this morning, but as we continue on, we will see the patience and the kindness of God. We will see the determination of God to bring redemption for a people who don't really want it. And in that way, what we find in Isaiah is really a a microcosm of the human story. 
But you remember back in Genesis 3, God pronounces a, a curse on Adam and Eve and the serpent because of their sin in the Garden of Eden. And in that curse, God wonderfully says that he will establish an enmity between the sons of the serpent and the sons of the woman. Now it's, it's crucial, we, we might skip past it as we eagerly go to Genesis 3.15 and the promise of that singular seed, that son of Eve who will crush the head of the serpent under his feet. But, but it's, it's crucial that we don't miss this point. That God says that he will establish an enmity between the sons of the serpent and the sons of the woman. Right? Adam and Eve had willingly joined with the devil in his enmity against God. That is what is happening when they eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They are putting themselves over and against God and declaring themselves to be enemies of God rejecting his rule, rejecting his law, and siding with evil. But as God weaves the gospel into that curse that he pronounces, he says that he will establish an enmity between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. That is to say that he will sovereignly establish an enmity. He will create an enmity that puts the godly seed over and against the forces of evil. It's the promise that God, in his grace, will bring redemption for a people who don't really want it. Our shorter catechism reflects this. When it meditates on Christ's office as king. In the Westminster Shorter Catechism, question 26, we are asked, how does Christ execute the office of a king? And the answer comes, Christ executes the office of a king in subduing us to himself, in ruling and defending us, and in restraining and conquering all his and our enemies. Right? Notice that first thing that the Westminster Shorter Catechism says that Jesus does in his office as king. He subdues us to himself. We need to be subdued. Because in our sin, we are over and against him. We are opposed to him. One of the first things that Jesus does for us is that he sovereignly creates an enmity, taking us from our natural disposition to evil and setting us over and against evil by uniting us to himself. Right? And that is one of the themes that we will see repeated throughout this book. A people who have sided with the devil, a people who have not listened to the word of God, a people who will not yield to the proclamation of the gospel, and yet we see the steady determination of God to bring for and through this stubborn people salvation. To bring through these stubborn Judeans a redeemer who will be one of their descendants. And while most of Isaiah's audience will be like that burned over forest that is described at the end of chapter 6. There is this promise that runs throughout this like a golden thread that God will, will, will sovereignly preserve a remnant. That God will sovereignly subdue a people for himself. And through that faithful remnant, the Redeemer will come. And that is really what we see here in this passage that we're looking at this morning. In this opening vignette, we, we see Isaiah going with the word of God to Ahaz, who has taken the throne after the death of Uzziah. And we see the determination of God to bless a resistant people and still bring his promises to fulfillment. Now the scene here is a fairly simple one, and we can very quickly grasp what's going on it's it's essentially a political scene that is repeated throughout history 
Here is Ahaz, a, a relatively young and inexperienced king of Judah. We are told in uh, in First Kings that that he was uh, about twenty when he came to the throne, and by all accounts was not a man of great wisdom or courage for that matter. And he is approached by Rezin, the king of Syria, and Pekah, the king of Israel. And they come up to Jerusalem with the purpose of bringing Judah into an alliance that will strengthen them against an increasingly emboldened Assyria. So Assyria is on the rise, and they are threatening to come down into into Palestine and to, to take that piece of ground and envelop it into the growing Assyrian Empire. Remember, one of the, the, the themes that runs behind all of this is the value of that strip of fertile land that, that Palestine is, lying between the Arabian Desert and the Mediterranean Sea. It was the highway between the great empire of Egypt and the great empires of northern Asia. So he who controlled Palestine had the upper hand. And Assyria has their eyes set on this piece of valuable real estate. And they want to take it. And, and Syria and the northern kingdom of Israel, they understand that, that alone they are too weak to face Assyria. And so they want to create this, this trans-Palestinian alliance that is able to more effectively repel any attacks that come from the north and so they want to bring Judah into their alliance now the tag that they take is not to send a diplomatic mission to Ahaz to try and convince him of the effectiveness of coming into their alliance essentially they come and they want to just depose Ahaz and put their own puppet king to Beal in his place so they've come up to Jerusalem, they brought their armies up to Jerusalem, apparently they've surrounded the city, and Ahaz is, is terrified at this prospect. He's essentially been put under house arrest, and there's no way for him to effectively repel this attack. And into his anxiety, and into his uncertainty, and into his uh, terror, Isaiah is sent by God to bring him what is essentially a word of tremendous comfort and assurance. Isaiah comes to him and, and says to him that within, within the span of a lifetime, 65 years, we're told, verse 8, in less than a, a lifetime, Ephraim, that is just another name for the northern kingdom of Israel, it will, it will fall to the Assyrians. Right? It's the promise that, that while Ephraim, Israel, and Syria looked so powerful, so intimidating, the truth is, God says through Isaiah to Ahaz, the axe is already laid at the roots. And just within the span of a lifetime, these two kingdoms that are now breathing threats at the gate of Jerusalem, they will be felled and, and burned. It was the promise of God to Ahaz that as bad as things seemed, if he cast himself upon the Lord and listened to his word and trusted him, then he would have nothing to fear. It's the challenge that's laid out before Ahaz at the end of verse 9. If you are not firm in faith, you will not be firm at all. Ahaz all of your earthly supports have fallen away. Ahaz, everything that you have used to prop up your kingdom has been taken away. And the fact that Isaiah goes up to him and meets him at the end of the conduit of the upper pool on the highway to the washer's field, it seems that Ahaz is out surveying the, the vulnerable water source into Jerusalem. Jerusalem's great weakness was that it didn't have an underground source of water. It had a, an overground channel. And so if, if, if Israel or, or, or Syria were to block that channel, then, then Ahaz was essentially undone. The city would have no choice but to surrender. He's in a perilous place. But here the word of God says to him, comes to him and says to him, Ahaz, you can be firm if you have faith in God's promises, 
If you, if you are firm in, in faith, you will, be, you will be firm to get through this. But if you are not firm in faith, then you will not be firm at all. Ahaz has been brought to a pressure point. He's been brought to a fork in the road. He can't just do nothing. He has to choose something. And so the, the choice is before him. Will he follow his senses and try and get out of this by political maneuvering? Will he try to use his own skills and wisdom to get himself out of this tight spot? Or... Will he cast himself upon the Lord and trust the word of God and trust that God will do what is seemingly impossible and lead and protect his people in the face of this threat? It's essentially the same challenge that we all face virtually every day. Now we, of course, don't have an army surrounding our city. But we may well have personal enemies. Maybe people at work who are actively undermining us. Or people who are competing for our jobs. Or simply working out of some obscure vendetta. Uh, maybe you have a long-running feud in your family that has torn your family apart for years, maybe even generations, personal enemies, people that you know are actively rooting against you. But maybe not. But we can put this more into the abstract, can't we? We're all surrounded by a world of evil. We may not struggle with personal enemies, but we all struggle with natural evil. It's one of the things that has become so evident in this pandemic. We live in an age in which we are able to sanitize death and, and, and hide it, essentially. Many of us can go our whole lives without even seeing a dead body, something that even a generation or two ago would not have been true. We can hide our diseases and our illnesses away. We're so used to modern medicine being able to just tackle whatever is wrong with us. But with this pandemic, we have been brought face to face with the reality of our, of our, of our real struggle with natural evil and the corruption that sin has brought into God's good world. Of course, we struggle also with the forces of evil. We struggle against the devil and his minions. The devil who, Scripture tells us, goes around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. The devil, I think we can picture, almost like Israel and Syria here, breathing threats against the church, pacing around the church, looking for an opportunity to attack and to come in against us the devil as scripture tells us in another place is the accuser of the brethren he is our personal en enemy who is trying to to accuse us and condemn us right, do you remember how paul puts this vividly in ephesians 6 he says we do not wrestle against flesh and blood but against the rulers against the authorities against the cosmic powers of this present darkness against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Paul says to the Ephesians, he says to us, if you are a Christian, then that is your constant struggle. You have an enemy who is against you. But of course, we also struggle with a humanity that has been deeply corrupted. Right? We struggle to live in a world in which things like the Ahmed Arbery shooting takes place. Right? One of the reasons why, why this has been so shocking for us is that we like to think we're better than that. We like to think that humanity is better than that. It's, it, it, we struggle to conceive that a young man can get murdered in the middle of the day and his perpetrators be allowed to go home and live without consequence for two months. And of course, it's not just him. Whenever we look at our news and we see word news of man's inhumanity to man the violence of our 
cities, the wars that are ongoing. We see that deep corruption that is come to reside within humanity because of our sin, our selfishness, our lack of love for one another. But we don't really even need to go outside of ourselves. Right? We struggle with our own sin. We struggle with that evil that bubbles up from our own hearts, as Jesus says in Matthew 15. Like Ahaz, we are a people whose enemies are at the gates. We are a people who are surrounded by threats, and like Ahaz, it can frighten us, it can terrify us. And like Ahaz, we are brought to a fork in the road and we are asked, what will you do with it? Will you rely upon yourself or will you rely upon the Lord? In 2 Corinthians 5, Paul says, For we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, We have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling, if indeed by putting it on we may not be found naked. For while we are still in this tent, we groan, being burdened, not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed, So that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. He who has prepared uh, prepared us for this very thing is God. Who has given us the spirit as a guarantee. So we are always of good courage. Knowing that while we are at home in the body we are away from the Lord. For we walk by faith not by sight. What Paul is saying there is that there are times... When it looks and feels like our earthly home is going to be destroyed. Times when we see and feel those enemies at the gates. When it feels like the, the dangers of life in a fallen world loom large against us. And even from within us. And so as Paul says, we, we, we groan longing for that day when we will be released and, and brought into our heavenly dwelling. When we will be free from all of these things. But in the midst of it all, Paul says, while we are still here, the word of God comes to us and it tells us of this radical security that is ours in Christ. The word of God tells us of God's promises, of God's faithfulness. And so we are called to walk by faith in God's promises. To not let our hearts be tossed to and fro by what we see and hear and feel and taste and touch. It's the same challenge that Isaiah gives to Ahaz. Like Ahaz, we face those pressure points, those forks in the road. We are forced to answer that question. In this moment, as I groan under this pressure, as I see these enemies, am I going to trust in myself? Or am I going to trust in the Word of God? Am I going to build my life on the sure and certain promises of God or am I going to do what I think is best for me in this moment and what this text is saying what this word to Ahaz is saying is the same as what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5 the only logical position to take is to build your life on the word of God To make your decisions based on what God has revealed. And to walk by faith and not by sight. Right, All the other ways will look like solid ground. It's going to look solid. To depend on your own wisdom. It's going to look solid to just buckle down and get through this. It's going to look solid to... To rely on your own experience. But, but what, what God is saying to Ahaz, what God is saying to us is it is a deception. It's, it's just sinking sand. 
the only way to be truly firm in the face of these threats that loom against us is to be firm in faith. It is to trust in the Word of God as that which makes us secure. Now that would be enough, wouldn't it? The, the, the passage could end and there and, and we would be happy, challenged, convicted perhaps. And we would hope that Ahaz would heed the word of God. God has given his word, the challenge has been laid down. Ahaz, be strong in faith because if you're not firm in faith then you will not be firm at all. Ahaz, this is your security. If you go looking for security anywhere else, you will not find it. It's enough. The the word of God has been given. The challenge has been laid down. But notice how God then goes on and he does something surprising. God, undoubtedly knowing Ahaz's frailty, invites him to do something that is virtually unprecedented. He invites Ahaz to ask him for a sign. Now usually asking for a sign in Scripture is a mark of weak faith or even skepticism. Uh, Gideon asks for a sign in Judges 6 when he is uncertain of God's call. The Pharisees, of course, ask for a sign from Jesus when they're trying to discredit him. It's usually not a good sign when somebody asks God for a sign. But here it is God who invites Ahaz to ask for one, who invites Ahaz to allay his doubts by receiving a tangible sign of the credibility of Isaiah's prophecy. But Ahaz dismisses it. He uses pious sounding language. He says, I will not ask, I will not put the Lord to the test. Now it seems like a spiritual answer. It's it's a quote of Deuteronomy 6.16. But you understand Ahaz's refusal to ask for a sign is sin because he is refusing the command of God. As Matthew Henry says, nothing is more grievous to the God of heaven than to be distrusted. And that is what Ahaz is doing. He He is not trusting God. He is cloaking himself in a facade of honor but underneath it on all there is a distrust of god a sinful stubbornness that refuses to obey the command of god what it reveals is that ahaz has made up his mind about what he is going to do and he is determined that he is going to rely upon himself That he is going to take things into his own hands and he is going to do what he thinks is right. And so Ahaz doesn't want a sign from God because that will only serve to tell him that he is wrong. Ahaz has decided what to do and he doesn't want God to come in and mess with his plans. But notice how God responds to him. He doesn't just throw up his hands and say, well... I I tried. No, God gives him the sign anyway. God says to him that a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. And before the boy knows how to refuse evil and choose the good, the king of Israel, Ephraim, and the king of Syria will be deserted. They will fall before their enemy. Now this is a sign that works on two levels. On the one level, it's essentially just a a reiteration and emphasis of what Ahaz has already been told in verse 8. That all these things would happen within his lifetime. Now there's an intensification to the promise here. Ahaz has been told that he won't even have to wait 65 years for this to happen this virgin will conceive and will bear a child and before he reaches the age of discretion in his adolescence all of this will come to pass there's an intensification to the promise in this child he has wait maybe 15 years and and all of this will come to pass you will see israel fall you will see syria fall this child 
is to be a living testimony to the veracity of God's word. That a young woman will bear this child and Ahaz can watch as this child grows and develops and he will see the veracity of God's word that by the time that boy reaches adolescence all of these things will have come to pass. And on one level that's it. Right, that's all this is. That this is the, the promise of, of just a child be being born to, to a, a, a young woman in Judah. Given this symbolic name of, of Emmanuel, which means God with us, which is the very thing that Ahaz is being encouraged to believe, that God was with him and with his people. Right, this, this child is to be this, this, this living symbol that God was with his people people even in their stubborn rebellion against him a symbol that God had not abandoned them or turned his back on them right in that this child is a gift of God's grace here is Ahaz who's hardened his heart against God who's resolved not to be firm in faith but to be firm in his own skill and in his grace God says look Ahaz this is what I will do I will defeat your enemies and within your lifetime Within the next 15 years, this looming threat will be brought to nothing. This child, standing as a living invitation for Ahaz to repent of his self-reliance and be firm in faith. And in one sense, that's, that's all this is. It's a sign that's given to Ahaz. But of course, on another level... We can see another side to this side. A side that we don't fully comprehend until we get to Matthew 1 verse 23. In that passage, Matthew is describing the revelation to Joseph that Mary will conceive by the Holy Spirit and bear a son. In Matthew chapter 1 from verse 20, we read this. As Joseph considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Now this is what Matthew says, all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. And then he quotes verse 14. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. And what Matthew is doing is he is recounting the birth narrative of Jesus. He almost stops, as it were, and turns and addresses his audience directly and says, Stop a minute and just just realize with me what has happened in the conception of Jesus. Isaiah 7.14 has found its ultimate fulfillment. Right here is not just the promise of God with his people. Here is the fulfillment of that promise. Here is the ultimate fulfillment of the promise that God has given to Ahaz. Here is the perfect, final, Emmanuel child born to a virgin. Now, the Emmanuel principle is one that is embedded in our Old Testament. It's the very thing that was symbolized and represented in the temple itself. Here was God dwelling in the midst of his people. Right? The promise of God with his people was the ground of their hope, the anchor of their security. That is what God has been saying to Ahaz. That is the message that Isaiah has been preaching to Ahaz, that God is is with his people, and so God can be trusted even in the midst of great uncertainty. But what Matthew wants us to understand is that that promise of God with his people has now been brought to its greatest possible fulfillment in the incarnation of our Lord Jesus. Right here is a child who doesn't just like this, the child of this young woman in Isaiah 7, doesn't just speak of God being with his people. 
Here is God himself conceived by the Holy Spirit in the womb of the Virgin Mary. Here is God himself come to dwell with his people. Right? And you understand what that means when we come to this passage in light of Matthew 1. When we come to the, to the pressure points of our lives, when we come to the forks in the road, when we are confronted with the same dilemma that faces Ahaz here, will you walk by faith or will you walk by sight? As you groan under the pressures of life in this fallen world, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, will you buckle down and rely on your own ingenuity and on your own skill and your own wisdom? Will you do what you think is right? Or will you trust in the word of God? When we come to this, when we see Jesus in fulfillment of Isaiah 7, 14, and when we come to those pressure points, those forks, you understand we have even greater reason than Abraham to be firm in our faith. The child born in 8th century BC Judah to this young girl, He was a tangible sign to Ahaz to trust in the word of God. He was a gift of God's grace. That for 15 years Ahaz could look upon this child, whoever he was. For 15 years this child just in his being would would be the perpetual call of the gospel to Ahaz to to repent of his sin and to put his trust in God. This was a good sign that God gave to a stubborn man. But in Jesus, we have an even greater sign. Because in Jesus, all the promises of God have come to their magnificent fulfillment. In Jesus, we see the goodness of God ultimately manifest. In Jesus, Specifically in the scorn that he faced and the hatred that led to his crucifixion. We see how God can use even these greatest threats against his church, against his people. As unwitting servants of his redemptive plan. In Jesus. In the true and greatest Emmanuel, we have been given the greatest of all possible reasons to be firm in faith, regardless of what comes. Because in him we have seen the ultimate revelation of God's faithfulness to a faithless people. In Isaiah, we will go on and we will continue to see the stubborn root of sin. And we will see how the pride of man puts God and man over and against one another. But we will also see this magnificent, persevering grace of God to sinners. We will see this patience of God that we see here to Ahaz, giving him these 12, 13, 14 years to repent of his stubborn self-will. We'll go on and see God continuing to condescend to his people and giving giving his word to his people and even giving signs like this child to his people. Psalm 95 urges us today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. That's the message here. In Christ, we have been given the greatest sign of God's grace and mercy. Not just the sign of his promises, but the one in whom those promises have been fulfilled. And so heed the preaching of Isaiah. Listen to the promises of God. See how they have been fulfilled in Christ and put your faith in him. And then you will find that peace and rest and security that can only come from God. Be firm in faith or you will not be firm at all. Let us pray. Almighty God, our Father in heaven, as we come to you this morning, we pray for the grace of your Holy Spirit that you would continue to break us from our sinful self-reliance. 
Oh, Father, if there are those who are listening to this message who still rely upon themselves, who still trust in themselves, who still look to themselves to get through the difficulties and the hardships of life, who look to themselves essentially as their own saviors, I pray that you would open their eyes to see their foolishness and that you would open their eyes to see Jesus as the strong and perfect savior that they need. But Lord, for those of us who have seen him as our Savior, who have laid hold of him by faith, I pray that you would continue to grant us grace, that more and more we might put to death that pride that remains in our hearts, and that more and more we might just hide ourselves in him. O oh Lord, come and bless us, we pray, for we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore. Amen.